Exciting. Um, it's described in RFC uh, 7489, for those of you who want a deep dive. It's domain-based message authentication reporting and conformance. So it's really um, exciting stuff. Um, and most of DMARC is actually technical, but what it adds is um, it's something else than a uh, technical solution. Um, I lost the signal there. Nope. Oh, there it is. Uh, who am I? Uh, sign out in the real world. Um, in the analog world, my name is Dennis. On Twitter, I'm at signoutdk, and there's a geek code block you can see if you download the PDF or view the presentation afterwards. Um, this is what I'm going through, a quick background, who can use it, overview, status, why is it important, and how does it work, and I'll mention a couple of tools to do it. Um, the background is that uh, in the in the beginning there's no money to be made of spam uh, from spam because uh, you couldn't use the the opera net commercially anyway uh, and up through the 80s and 90s it increased of course and in i think around 2010 90 percent of all emails was actually spam you had to do something about it who can use dmark everybody should they yes of course um this is uh, the standard uh, mail delivery. Uh, someone uh, composes and sends an email. Uh, sending mail server inserts the DKIM header. Uh, it is sent to the receiving mail server. Then you do the standard validation tests of uh, block, block lists, uh, reputation, rate limits, and whatever. Then you come into this uh, exciting green box that actually is the DMARC policy, uh, where you ve uh, retrieve and uh, verify the DKIM you uh, uh, validate the uh, SPF and you uh, ap apply a policy which can, which can be uh, pass quarantine or uh, reject. Um, and the, the different parts is uh, the SMTP part, you know, where you type hello and mail from and stuff like that, that's covered in RFC uh, 5321. That's the SPF. Uh, 5322 is uh, the DKIM part. It's, it's a message header, like the content of the email. So that's actually what your most mail clients are showing. Um, so it's important to distinguish between the envelope and the actual letter if, you, uh, if you're doing debugging in, in this case. But if you need to do debugging, you'll probably figure it out. But keep that in mind uh, if you're ever in that situation. Uh, the current status is that it's working fine. It's implemented in, uh, in most of the MTAs. Uh, RFC is from 2015, so it's five years ago. Uh, it's uh, it's implemented uh, basically in all mail servers you can find. It's uh, in the process of becoming an ITF standard as well. Um, and it's important because it's um, for the business, it provides better uh, protection of your domain. That's probably what you can use as a selling point if you need time to, to implement it. Uh, and the second importance is that it, it allows you to um, monitor and collect reports on uh, the uh, the attempted abuse of uh, of your domain as uh, as an email sender. Uh, and if you have ever tried implementing uh, SPF and DKIM in a large-ish environment, you'll prob you'll know that you're working uh, mostly blindfolded. And this is where uh, DMARC can actually help a bit. Um, it works in the way that uh, you have your SPF record, um, and don't do it like this because it has a plus all, which basically means fuck you, I don't care. Uh, it just uh, anybody can send on behalf of this domain. Um, also, d don't use this uh, tilde all because that's kind of a, I don't know, I don't care. Uh, you have to decide yourself. It's a bi it's a somewhere between neutral and fail, but you have to decide on your own. Um, a proper record looks kind of like this, where you have uh, MX and IP addresses or and minu end with minus all, which means that no one else and the ones on this list can actually send emails. Um, and what it adds is a policy. So you have uh, V equals uh, dmark1, is it's uh, dmark version 1, P equals none. Uh, that is, uh, I, don't I only want to collect data on this, and the RUA is... Uh, 
is where the reports are mailed to. It's an XML format. And uh, don't parse it yourself. There's uh, online tools to help you with that. Um, you can get this uh, status uh, detail from a site called Demartian. Um, you can see the SPF is yellow, uh, attention needed. That's because I have the plus all, and that's not really, uh, that's not a good thing. Um, it's green, e even though the P equals none, the no policy uh, is present. Um, the, ver the options for policy is none, which means collect uh, uh, reports. You can have quarantine, that means if someone else than those on the SPF list are sending a market as spam, or you can uh, have a reject as policy, that means uh, if anybody else is trying to send it, you should just uh, discard the email immediately. Um, do we have time for a live demo? Well, we have 10 slides left and three minutes, but enjoy. This is the Demartian interface. Um, you can see uh, there are some various statistics on the origin of the mail servers, mainly Russia, for some reason. Um, if you go into uh, the volume part here, you can see that it's uh, 24 unknown emails uh, in volume details. You can see uh, sorted by day or where it is. and. You can actually uh, expand this as well and see what sending servers are actually doing this, and it's mainly Russian, there's a Chinese, and uh, so you can get reports and see where you are, uh, where they are originating from, uh, and you can see that the reporter here is from Google and Mail.ru. Yahoo also sends uh, these uh, DMARC reports if you request it, but none of the other major players is really doing anything good in this thing yet, but it'll probably be better soon. Um, the way that the, the text record is made is um, this version 1, then you have the policy. If Here you have the quarantine as a policy, and you can set the PCT. That's the percentage of emails that are hit by this policy. So if you want to lean softly into it, you can just start by enabling it and setting it to none to collect reports, and when you're brave enough to actually enable it, um, you can just set it to 1%, so only 1% of your emails uh, is actually being treated by this, and if you have a large environment, it still may be many emails, but you'll, um, you'll get a better idea, and when you uh, are feeling brave, you can set it to 5% and 30% and 100%, and then you can change the policy from, um, from quarantine to reject, and do the increasing of the percentage again from 1, 5, 30, whatever. So DMARC is send a policy framework plus DKIM and a policy. Um, I'd recommend it that you look at uh, demartian.eu, uh, run by a really nice guy. You can it's, it's free for personal use. Uh, so if you have just a couple of domains, just put them in there. You can get. Uh, the good reports, uh, and there's also a list of, uh, actually I forgot to show you that. Um, you can, um, here, if you go on the domain list, there's uh, tasks and issues as well. So here you can see that I have a domain, kudpolek.dk, it needs DMARC to be added. And there's an issue, which is that Kupalik.deco doesn't have a SPF record at all. So it actually it also helps you through the process of actually enabling DMARC for your domains. That's pretty handy if you're someone somewhat unsure of the process. But use these two tools. Uh, DMARC, uh, as I said, uh, free for personal use. Um, if you're a commercial user, you can pay a bit for, for the service. And I do that for where, I, uh, where I'm uh, currently at. Uh, also, there's hardenize.com, which is a generic tool for hardenizing all of your infrastructure. Also, um, it checks your uh, TLS setup and stuff like that. It's an invite-only site, but uh, ask for invites. They're pretty fast to let you in. Um, things that aren't covered in this talk is DNSSEC, DAIN, MTS, STS, and TLS reporting. Uh, you can look that up for yourself. Uh, and there's like 45 seconds for questions, if you have any.
That's true. There is a problem with mailing lists. Uh, I, th I think it's uh, it's a matter of uh, pushing them to doing it uh, because DMARC is merely the policy of enforcing the policy framework and the KIM in one tool with reporting as well. Um, so it's true that there is uh, a problem with mailing lists in particular, but there isn't really a lot of commercial users using like uh, mailing lists, um, and there is a workaround for that as well. Um, if there's any more questions, I'm in the first of the caravans after the info booth. Feel free to drop by and talk. Hello, I'm a first time presenter, so this will be my experiment, is to talk consistently into the microphone. All right, so uh, this lightning talk is, uh, I'll give you the TLDR, is uh, I used to spend a lot of time on Exorcism, which is Exorcism.io is a learning project for like, uh, you can learn programming languages. Uh, and I think they have like more than 50 languages you can learn. And uh, they have some structural problems, but they have a mass momentum. And I want to know if there's better ways to do it where you overcome some of the scaling problems. Uh, so this is uh, a call to investigation. If anyone is curious about uh, collaborative uh, learning uh, platforms, is are there ways where we can use decentralized uh, systems like Git uh, when it the subject matter is going to be programming anyway. So maybe for some learning material, Git would be a showstopper because they, it's a difficult thing to learn. But specifically for programming, that might not be a problem at all. In fact, it might be a benefit. So um, I'm going to start by saying, uh, I think in 2018, I started, uh, I, I thought maybe, maybe I should uh, try and learn OCaml. And I, I already know a very similar programming language, so I thought maybe I can learn the, like the dialect part, like maybe I can transfer my knowledge from one language to the other if I just complete a few exercises. It's just like to get to know the syntax and do a few problems and realize what are the differences like in dialect. And I think exercise, exercise was really great for that because I signed up and I went through 10 exercises where I got custom feedback from uh, someone who probably had more experience with, uh, with uh, OCaml than me. And, um, and uh, the waiting time was maybe a day between each uh, handing in an exercise. I got feedback within a day. And I thought this was fine because I could just do uh, side exercises. I could just uh, brush up on other things. But eventually, I got a bit bored waiting. So I thought I'll just open another track, like another language that I'm familiar with. Maybe I like it even more. And that track had, uh, that was the Haskell track, that track had even worse performance. So um, maybe the average waiting time there was uh, a week before I got feedback on a simple exercise that might have taken me five minutes to complete. So this was very dissatisfying. So I decided, okay, maybe I'll just become a mentor on that track and then I follow the other track. So I'm learning something and I'm giving something. And that is only reasonable because, I mean, I get other people's time for free, I should give some back, right? It's like questioning and answering on IRC channels or whatever. Um, but the burden was just so big. So I, I basically kind of quit 
learning OCaml and I just became a, what the role is called a Mensa. So you have three roles, like a student, a Mensa, and a maintainer. So there's a part of the infrastructure for each language track, for, for example, what are the exercises for this language, that is, that's run, one role in the system is to maintain those. Another one is to give feedback. Uh, so feedback is given on the website that is developed in, I think, Ruby on Rails or something. And the organization, Exorcism, the organization has um, kind of a bottleneck because they, they, they are not a op free or open source software project, but they're an, a non-profit NGO that uses open source and free software to, to kind of reach that goal of kind of uh, programming education for everyone or something like that. Um, but uh, because the organization is running and in, 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 in reproducing the website, fixing bugs, extending the interface for when people deliver solutions and the feedback interface for mentors is on the website, this kind of, because there's very limited amount of, of uh, hired programmers to do this, uh, then the development here has to be kind of angled and very prioritized and uh, they don't accept a lot of uh, outside help because managing people's uh, code for this, uh, they kind of assess is, is kind of, they, they would end up spending more resources cultivating the type of development they, they expect. So this part is not really open sourced. It's open sourced, but it's not uh, free, free to contri contribute to. Uh, and I think that's a, like a massive problem because one of the bottlenecks uh, is you don't want to have to wait. So for example, for the Rust track, if you handle, hand, hand in your solution to some kind of hello world like problem, the, way, the average waiting time would be two months before you get feedback. That is enough time for you to completely have either quit the, the, uh, quit the learning the language or have found some other source of learning it, right? You, you don't want to wait two months between like very simple assignments that take maybe 10 or 15 minutes to complete. So of course, Exorcism has addressed these problems by trying to automate some of the uh, feedback mechanisms by making auto graders and this, uh, this is a massive effort because every single language has to build the exercises from the bottom up with these in mind. Uh, some, of, some languages don't have the same infrastructure for uh, parsing itself and doing syntax trees. So for example, uh, languages like C Sharp, uh, is, is, this is really easy because you have a well compiler support for that and Python I think is pretty easy too. And you also have a, like a, an abundance of people who want to do that for those languages. But maybe for Perl, you don't have the same uh, luxury of a lot of people contributing uh, hours and hours of work. So this is uh, some of uh, my experience with the platform. I think it's an excellent platform and it has some bottlenecks. Uh, and also uh, the last thing I would uh, highlight from, from uh, having experience with it is when you contribute, you get uh, access to a website where you can upload a file and you get a command line tool where you can uh, uh, where you can upload it using the command line tool. So if you're writing in uh, your solution in a file on your file system, you can use that command line interface to upload your files. This is really smart, but it's also kind of a simulation or an approximation of a similar command you might use as a real developer using Git or something similar. Um, and uh, what I think is maybe make that part more realistic because you're gonna learn to do that anyway. So why create like a separate ecosystem only for simulating real work? Uh, why not use Git to fully leverage the, the decentralized aspects of this platform? And uh, having kind of uh, pointed out at least most of the scaling problems in terms of there's not enough uh, mentoring capacity and uh, the software infrastructure for the Exorcism project also has some development bottlenecks. At one direction that I would propose is to, uh, to look at uh, something like GitHub Classrooms, which is something that was released by GitHub this year, I think, uh, which is kind of like um, a intended for uh, school systems that they can uh, create organizations and uh, projects and assignments and the, you have these entities um, inside the GitHub classroom system and then work from there. See if, if GitHub, GitHub is enough or if we want to kind of 
take it even further, go more decentralized, and basically uh, reinvent this kind of collaborative learning where everyone is kind of connected as a node in the system. Uh, I will be spending a bit of time doing this uh, today, and if anyone is interested in collaborative uh, programming platforms, growing them, using them, uh, come and talk to me, and uh, maybe you have some good ideas, or maybe you have a completely different experience report. And I would also like to hear that. So uh, that concludes my talk. Uh, here after the thing and also I have a, a workshop tomorrow uh, called solving JQ problems and this would be a good place where we can kind of bootstrap uh, for example github classrooms because it will be a workshop and it it would be possible to use github classrooms so at least the next time on, I'm on schedule is in that workshop uh, but otherwise immediately after the lightning talks I'll be around This is very uh, unprepared, but uh, this uh, uh, two or three days ago, uh, last weekend, uh, we uh, were last two and one more semester uh, from Denmark. We were competing in the different uh, finance business. And you see mics? Oh, there it is. Where is it? Hello? Yeah, okay. So, uh. <laughs> uh, uh Yeah, can everybody hear me? Yep. You're great? Good. Okay, so uh, this week, uh, just before one hack, uh, me and my friend, we were playing in the uh, DEF CON uh, final CTF. Uh, the team, uh, Team Norse Code, uh, which is a like a collaboration team between all of the Nordics, uh, Nordic uh, teams, CTF teams, uh, the best teams, so uh, Hacking for Sergio and Boot Plugs and on, uh, collaborate on competing in, yeah, the hardest uh, CTF competition like ever. Um, yeah, and we're going to talk a bit about that and we actually hope that you have mostly questions for us uh, about how it is. So um, yeah, it was an A&D CTF, which means everybody has a server and then we are like trying to hack each other's services. And there is no SLA, so uh, like uh, there's no like uh, machine checking if the binary is correct or you just passed everything uh, patched the service out you didn't have like SSH into the vulnerable vulnerable box itself but you have like this form um, maybe a bit hard to see but it's like here you can submit flags or create an like auto submitter based on it and then all the challenges get released here and you get like pcaps from all the servers and here you could also submit patches because if you find a vulnerability, start setting one team, like go, start making an exploit, and then you have like another half of the, of the team, go uh, make a, uh, a patch for this. And then you are very limited in 
how these patches could be applied. So often you could, at most, uh, edit a few uh, hundred bytes. So, so you really had to patch in the binary. And of course, in these kind of channels, you don't um, you don't got get the source code. So, um, so yeah, you only have like the binary format. You have to reverse it, and just to some kind of peek into how how hard, extremely hard are these challenges. So one of them, the first, was like a parallel operating system uh, built completely from uh, scratch, and also a, a custom architecture. So it was a binary file uh, that like um, yeah that that ran uh, as a VM. Uh, on top of that, there was some uh, there was some uh, some services running inside of this this custom VM, uh, and it was all written in a custom architecture you never seen before, and also the OS was still like dynamically load uh, load files like from Elf and so on, but a completely custom uh, OS and uh, architecture, and then you had to like reverse these and uh, and find the exploit in these pre-installed files. So you really have to reverse an entire. Uh, virtual uh, machine uh, from scratch and you have like eight hours or so before uh, the shift ends to do this so that is the, the kind of level we're talking about here um, and uh, we have also uh, we have also some uh, brought some images I just found them here uh, if I can get my mouse over here uh, 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 um. okay I can take this Oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah, this is also very good. Yeah. So that is kind of like a, a, what we call Minus Club. Uh, so that is an overview of all the teams, our auto flags mixing system. So we just like put a Python script and it just prints out flags in STD out. Mm -hmm. And then this system would automatically like find the flag in, in all of these logs. Here is like our runners, so uh, the scripts that we run. Um, yeah. yeah, and here we can see all of the other teams. We got uh, tenth, by the way. Yeah. A competition of sixteen teams to get the world. Mm. Yeah, tenth in uh, in gen general and, and ten in attacking, yeah. but, which is the most important thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, <laughs> uh, we also had some uh, practical stuff. So as Alexander said, we were uh, we met at uh, in Stockholm with all the other people from the other teams, and um, uh, there you can also we also have some uh, photos here. One of the challenges was a uh, a uh, capture the flag. Uh, no, 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 King of the Hill, sorry, <laughs> King of the Hill challenge, where you had to, um, you had to create an AI that uh, was uh, to compete with the other, uh, with the other pe people. So you uploaded your AI and that controlled a little ship that had to, to shoot all the other ships. Uh, and uh, and um, well, it wasn't only that simple because they had also put in some intentional bugs uh, in, the, in the code that actually ran this. So it had a uh, buffer overflow, at least uh, that's the one we found, uh, where you could actually, um, uh, extend so you were able to extend the space and, and override some of the checks for the size of this AI so, so you can get a big AI with uh, that was better at uh, at attacking the other people and, and here we have a little uh, photo of everybody standing around the same screen and uh, looking at the at the small planes flying around and yeah. shooting each other yeah. that's five minutes um, right and then we have other pictures here oh and I have those at, uh, here Yes, so this was the venue we were sitting at, and uh, we were uh, at the venue, we were t uh, 20 people, and uh, there were about 5 to 10 uh, uh, at their own homes on Discord uh, helping us, but maybe a bit more. But, but it was mainly the people at the venue we, like, right. yeah, we interacted with, and it's, it's also a bit easier when you're just sitting in the same place to, to help out on. So this was a, like, uh, big, big, big event, so it was like state funded from the police government uh, this competition so we had all the food and everything we needed everything was just sponsored so it was no time yeah, to make pizza nice. someone brought it uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's also one of the lessons learned so we, we had booked a, a hotel uh, close by that we did not use at all uh, yeah. it was there was like you had to be ready if, if anything happened yeah. and uh, and also like spending those extra 15 minutes walking back and forth is uh, it's time wasted yeah. So, uh, it's so really, yeah. it's really time intensive. Yeah. You just have to be there all the time, get four hours of sleep at most, <laughs> and then back home. Yeah, yes. really there were down, downtime in between uh, when, when, you couldn't, uh, when you couldn't harvest flags from the other yeah. teams. But, um, 
but but then you still had the you still had the binaries and you're still able to to yeah. to uh, to reverse engineer those uh, still so so there were really you really had to choose when to when to go to bed and when not to yeah. uh, so it was structured in shifts so it was like uh, when you the server gets up you get one hour to set it, set everything up and then um, and then after that hour it starts then the fla a flex uh, starts coming in and every like six minutes and six minutes there's uh, six minutes with one tick every tick there's a new flag on the server so every six minutes you can like go get another flag with the same age points and then ha have this time where you yeah really uh, that is that's the most critical time span where the server's live then it will like after eight hours or something then it will go down and say okay now the server's closed now you can reverse engineer you can start making patches so everything is ready when next shift starts and at the beginning at each shift is like there comes some new challenges mm. and you really just have to be quick and then really the other teams are very very good <laughs> like yeah. like really good for instance we had one uh, one um, uh, one like module it was a mo module written in Node.js and it had some bugs in it and the best team like no they didn't actually I win but the know. ones that w w were leading the most of the time uh, they found uh, they f they got a flag in the first tick so yeah. within the first six minutes they had a working exploit against it yeah. <laughs> and then you're really like okay yeah. now okay. now we also have to find something because they're <laughs> harvesting flags at least trying to patch it or something yeah. like that it's a so, uh, extremely hard competition yeah and the other teams are extremely good. So yeah. So yes. Any questions about uh, being at the uh, yeah? Yeah. You no. Know. Well, no, but but there were P caps given yeah. by the game. Um, what's it called? Like the the game the network. Game so yeah, the, the game. game there was like this instance that run all of the servers. So we were also getting P caps from all of the other teams. Mm. Or kind of. There are two ports you could attack on: one stealth port and the normal port. If you hack on the normal port, you get full points, but everything. Everyone can see all the traffic on the north port, south port, south port, half the points, but there is no key PCAP released. Mm. So you kind of have to decide whether or not you want, want to stop this mm. or not. We also, s there was some, some of the challenges were solved because of the PCAPs. Yeah, um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, definitely. And was like but, of, but many, many, many of the good teams, at least, of course, like, sense a lot of bullshit with the, with the, with the actual exploit. No, 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 you could, uh, you could snip, uh, but we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, yeah, snip, snip every packet, no. they were just released to us, mm. and then we could go through it, and yeah, that was a lot of work, and it's like, it's yeah. like a really big meta game, because you could also submit patches, and the patches, the package for patching your vulnerability, that's also exposed, so people can go like, just, if they can figure out how this patch works, just go mm. and copy it, and you can of course backdoor the patch. Cool, let's give a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>